So he doesn't have a car. So I mean, I actually you, have my car. Yeah. You do? Awesome. Yeah. Um, so Christian, they has the screen, you know, so you can see what's coming up next. Uh huh. So if you want, if you want to just kind of check through a little bit, you can use this remote if you'd like. Um, this has a laser and. So you can use this if you like this left right laser, uh -huh. and then if you push this, it'll turn it black, and you'll panic for a second. Just push it again, and it'll come back again. <laughs> okay. Uh, or you can you can use the ruler if you want. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, so uh, how come you, is it a, uh, did you get a
Started. I've been asked to remind everybody to sign in if you got pizza. Uh, and uh, so that's me asking you guys to sign in if you got pizza. Uh, so today we have Christian Reichardt, who is a good friend and a close uh, collaborator. Uh, Christian just reminded me I've known him actually since 2000, 
actually since 2000, when I came to Caltech, uh, you were a junior, I think. Um, Christian's a remarkable, uh, remarkably productive scientist. He's been working uh, for a relatively short amount of time. And, and you may not know this, but you've heard of the H index, right? Mm -hmm. So the H index was invented by our colleague here, uh, Jorge Hirsch, who's a physics professor. H comes after him. But I recently, after looking at your publications, um, Google Scholar, come up with a new index called the age index, which is what is your age relative to your age, divided by your age. That's a thing. That is a thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> you stole my idea. Yeah, and he didn't even knew that. The satellite was. Yeah. All right. So Christian has an age H index of one, basically. Uh, which is which is to say his age index is over 30, and uh, it's quite remarkable for such a young uh, scholar in the field. Uh, and, and a lot of that's attributed to publications that he's led um, the, the, the workforce. So in particular, the Akbar experiment, which is a PhD thesis. He got his PhD in 2008, that's right, 2008, working on the Akbar experiment, which until very recently had the, you guys missed my introduction of a statistic called the age index, which has already been co-opted by somebody else called the chemistry index, sorry. So Christian uh, uh, worked on the Akbar experiment and deployed to the South Pole to um, to uh, deploy the hardware that he had worked on while he was a grad student for Akbar in 2005. So he's been to the South Pole um, and yet returned to tell the tale about it. So today he's going to talk about an experiment that's currently going on at the South Pole, uh, which is a uh, which is a sort of a competitor to polar bear, but also he's a collaborator on polar bear. So he's kind of in the catherine seat. He gets to work on two exciting experiments at the same time. And really, what he's trying to do, as he says in his title, is probing fundamental physics, which is to say. We're now probing what I consider the fourth most important particle in, in all of physics. George considers it the most important particle in physics, namely the neutrino mass. I mean, imagine if we didn't know the mass of the, of the, of the proton, of the electron. So Christian's going after probing aspects of fundamental physicists, heretofore reserved for our high energy colleagues who are now coming down because they smell pizza all the way from there. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have Christian. He's visiting today and tomorrow. Uh, we have spots for dinner available if people are interested uh, and lunch tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, so please contact me if you're not on the list to meet with him. And otherwise, we're going to hear about this exciting new physics being pro uh, probed by two of Christian's experimental uh, projects. Thank you, Brian. So as Brian yeah. said, I first went down to South Pole back in 2004. And I saw the foundations of the South Pole Telescope starting to be built, uh, the ICE Foundation program. And I've been fortunate enough to work at it, on it as my main focus while at UC Berkeley. During the course of the talk, I'll begin with a brief introduction and review of cosmology. Use this to motivate why we built the South Pole Telescope Survey, as well as the polar bear surveys, uh, and what we are finding in these surveys. From there, I'll focus in on the power spectrum of the cosmic ray background, which is the normal way we have to interpret the data for these surveys, uh, and talk about what we have, the features in the power spectrum and the cosmological interpretation thereof. And in particular, I'll be looking at what we can learn about inflation from the cosmic microwave background. And then I'll transition from data that we have to data that we're taking with CMB polarization, which can tell us both about inflation, but also about gravitational lensing of the cosmic microwave background, which gives us a handle on structure growth and the masses of neutrinos, as Brian mentioned. And I'll be talking about two experiments on the sky right now, SPT pole and polar bear, and their planned successors, SPT 3G and the Simons Array. So the current model of cosmology right now is lambda CDM, <coughs> lambda for a cosmic constant, CDM for cold dark matter. It's a fairly simple model in terms of number of parameters. You have six free parameters. Yet this model can actually explain all the observations we have today, ranging from the temperature and polarization and entropies in the cosmic microwave background to the distribution and number counts of galaxies or galaxy clusters on the sky to measurements of the geometry of the universe, such as the luminosity distance relationship from supernova. At this point, we have, of course, thousands of data points constraining the six parameter models. We have very tight constraints on our model parameters, uh, pinpoint down a very tiny region of space, and we've learned that we live in a flat universe. Uh, the initial perturbations are nearly Gaussian and scale invariant, and the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating today, somewhat counterintuitive. <laughs> and this points to one of the interesting aspects of this model, although it's very simple, a lot of the major points of the model are still are not very well understood. So 95% of the universe's energy density there is composed in the dark sector of dark matter and dark energy. 
And of course, the very name encapsulates how little we understand about what these objects actually are. In addition, we typically invoke a period of superluminal expansion early on, inflation, to address, for instance, the horizon problem. Um, however, we don't know what causes this rapid expansion in the early universe. So all three of these are pointing to physics beyond the standard model uh, that we could understand by studying cosmology. To understand how you might learn about this, it's useful to look at how the universe evolves in the standard model of cosmology. This is a pictorial representation of the history of the universe uh, that you've likely seen before. And loosely speaking, you can break down the history into sort of five epochs: inflation, the early hot plasma, realization, the structure formation, and the accelerated expansion. Um, what's nice is that my work relates to each one of these different epochs on the following slides. I'll go through these in a little more detail and highlight some of the questions that remain about each epoch. Um, we start off with inflation, in which you have this sort of either the safety expansion of the universe. Uh, this addresses problems ranging from the phase coherence of the CMB to the horizon problem to why we don't see mag magnetic monopoles. However, it's a big black box. We don't know at what energy scale that still comes into play, and we don't really know what is driving this rapid expansion, uh, and whether it's a connection to the late time acceleration in the late time universe. Um, after inflation, we have a fairly good idea of how a hot plasma will evolve. As the universe expands, this plasma cools off, and different particle species can fall out of thermal equilibrium and survive at some relative uh, particle abundance. Eventually, you cool down sufficiently that your protons and electrons combine from neutral hydrogen. And the cross section between free electrons versus neutral hydrogen is much higher, so now the photons can escape to free stream all the way to the observed phase. So we get a snapshot of what the universe looks like a few hundred <coughs> thousand years after the Big Bang in the cosmic microwave background. And this is our first okay. image of the universe with electromagnetic radiation. Um, in the post Planck era, you can learn more by studying polarization and smaller scale anisotropies to learn both about the initial conditions and about inflation thereby, as well as particle physics in the early universe, like the decaying dark matter of zero neutrinos and other uh, extensions to the standard model. Um, after the first of the last scattering, you have a fairly neutral sea of hydrogen. But eventually, under gravity, these form the first stars and then the first galaxies, uh, which produce UV and X-ray photons uh, that should reionize the universe around it. And we know that by a redshift of six or so, the universe has reionized. Uh, but we don't really know what sources cause this reionization, what kind of stars, what kind of galaxies, and in fact, whether ordinary stars and galaxies are sufficient or whether there's something more exotic uh, going on to drive the reionization process. And this has, of course, been a major focus of 21 centimeter surveys, uh, and we'd like to understand this in more detail. Structure continues to form in the ionized universe. And by studying this process, you can learn about dark matter, which is driving much of the structure growth. Um, as it's forming under gravitational infall to form larger and larger structures in a bottom-up model. And by studying the process of structure growth, you can learn not only about dark matter, but also other properties like the masses of neutrinos. Since mass neutrinos act like a form of hot dark matter that delays structure growth on the smaller angular scales. And the last half of the universe lifetime or so, you know, below residue of one. Uh, instead of being a matter-dominated universe, we transition to being a dark energy-dominated universe, and the acceleration expansion the universe begins to accelerate. This was first discovered by supernova, but has since been uh, observationally confirmed by a number of other measurements, from very increased oscillations to CMB blending. Um, but we don't know what is causing this acceleration. And it could be a breakdown of general activity and cosmological distance scale, it could be a dynamical dark energy model, or it could be the cosmological constant that Einstein had proposed. Any one of these would be very interesting physics. The nice part about doing a small scale cosmic microbiome survey is that you can actually touch upon all these different epochs. So, of course, you get a snapshot of the early universe, which can tell you about those initial conditions, inflation, and particle physics in the early hot universe. Uh, but these CMB photons have traveled through the entire universe, and they bear some small imprint of all the structure along those lines of sight. There's two main uh, effects there's this near the Doge signal in which you have Compton scattering between free electrons and the CMB photons. And there's gravitational lensing, in which the path of your photons is bent by a structure along that line of sight. And these two effects give you sensitivity to anything from the epic realization to the dark energy, per se, looking for galaxy clusters here at the CMB of the dose. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on these two questions, what cause inflation, and what we can say about neutrino masses from gravitational lensing. To do this science, we built the South Pole Telescope which is a 10-meter telescope located at our best 
a known millimeter wave observation site. To understand why the South Pole is such a great site for millimeter wave observations, it's useful to know what an atmosphere emits at these wavelengths, and that's water vapor. Um, water vapor is not very well emitted in the atmosphere, so it leads you a time variant signal depending on how these clouds are blowing in front of your telescope. And the best way to get rid of water vapor is to go to some place that's really, really cold. And the coldest temperature every winter at the South Pole is actually below the sublimation point of dry ice at sea level. So it's really cold at the South Pole. Um, and that means we have very little water vapor in the atmosphere, so we have a very clean atmospheric signal uh, to look for. In addition, you can see a very clean patch of extragalactic psi that allows you to do very deep CMB maps. Uh, we also have a state-of-the-art telescope. 10 meters gives you an arc minute resolution on the sky, which is well matched to, say, a galaxy cluster size. Uh, it's designed for surveys. You can scan quickly, 2 degrees per second azimuth, with about a 1 square degree field of view right now. This is a picture of the collaboration at our last collaboration meeting in Chicago, around 50 people. Uh, this metal piece actually is part of the telescope that we had to replace, the ads bearing, um, in 2009, uh, because it broke and had to put in a new one. Uh, we've put three receivers on the telescope so far. Uh, the first one, SBTSC, it's the one that you've probably seen the most science results from with this telescope. Uh, SBT Pole is observing right now, and SBT 3G is planned to observe in a couple of years. Now, SBTSC was built at the UC Berkeley Nanofab facility, has about a thousand detectors, uh, and each one of these triangles here is a single frequency, potentially. Those are different filtered frequencies. Uh, four of these triangles are at 150 gigahertz, which is our main science band, and then one each at 95 and 220 gigahertz. Uh, so we get down to the noise levels you can see here, across 2,500 square degrees, which is about 6% of the night sky. And to interpret this noise level, if you break down the 2,500 square degree map into one arc minute by one arc minute pixels, uh, the RMS across those pixels would be 18 microkelvin at 150 gigahertz. <coughs> now, we put a new receiver on this telescope in 2012. Uh, this had two main advantages over the first receiver. We changed to a polarization sensor detector, so we can go after CMB polarization. And we have 50% more detectors for better mapping speed. Uh, since we're going for CMB polarization, which is a fainter signal, we are targeting a smaller patch of sky, but to much lower noise levels, about four times slower noise on four times smaller area of sky. And we're currently planning the third receiver, SPT 3G. Um, which we're going to increase the detector count by a factor of 10, so a tremendous factor. And we're getting this increase uh, in detector count in two uh, ways. First of all, we're redesigning the optics. Uh, the secondary mirror has been replaced as well as the lens system to expand the real estate on the focal plane by a factor of three. And second of all, instead of going with these steep horn coupled uh, single frequency pixels, we're going to broadband sinuous wave antennas coupled with lenses to the sky. We're going to get three pixels off Every, our three frequencies off every pixel on the sky. And with this camera, we're going to survey, again, 2,500 square degrees down to ultra-low noise level, uh, two and a half microkelvin arc minutes at 150 gigahertz. <coughs> uh, but to return to what we have right now, this is the current survey in all its glory, 2,500 square degrees, also shown here on the all-sky globe to give you a sense of where it is on the sky. Um, this is, of course, a smaller patch of sky than a satellite experiment like WF or Planck, but we're much lower noise with much better resolution on the sky. So there's some variation on deepest times area you can get. This is the deepest, largest area map. Compared to WMAP, our beam size is 13 times smaller, and our noise levels are about 17 times lower than WMAP. And compared to Planck, uh, WMAP's successor, uh, we still have a beam size that's six times smaller than Planck, and our noise levels are two and a half times lower noise. So we have better resolution and much slower noise than the satellite term. And part of that's just as much as you did have a large telescope on the ground than it is to launch into space. Um, so can I ask a dumb question? Mm -hmm. How much are these pictures that we usually see are raw, and how much, of, how much processing goes on top of this to actually come to this picture? I mean, is this the raw picture? This is how it looks? How much filtering? How much? This is fairly lightly filtered because we want to recover the large scales. Uh, for most of our science, we filter it more heavily because we don't actually care about recovering the scales that you're seeing here. What goes into this? Because I never know it's never So we have, you know, we have uh, some data quality selection where we throw away bad data, where we either don't have calibration or you see, say, a cosmic ray or some other event in your data. Um, and then you, for this map, it's virtually, I think we removed like a mean from each one of our scans and then just binned it up. 
into the map. This is a very <laughs> lightly processed filter for this map. Um, more typically, we do do more filtering. We remove a common mode across our array, which is basically atmospheric noise uh, blowing through. Um, that's our main filtering. And for polarization, sometimes you know we difference the two polarizations in the pixel, and again, to remove that atmospheric noise on these large scales. And what's the dynamic range of vertical scale? What, 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 what is the different colors in each uh, This is about plus or minus uh, 200 microkelvin. What does it tell you? It's a measurement of the temperature, yes. how much the temperature is varying across the sky. So you know, it's a 200 microkelvin temperature variation, plus or minus. So it's around a range of 400 microkelvin from the uh, darkest blue to the white. Yeah. And it's Scale. basically a fixed, a fixed, a three fixed frequencies. You just measure intensity. This is, is only one on? frequency map. So, this so is you have three single. such maps. If I understood we have three such maps. maps. Yes. Um, this is uh, 90 gigahertz, which is the <coughs> easiest one to recover the large scales on. And for the very large scales, you don't really care about the mo mo the multi frequency is more important for the small scale information than the large scale information, because on large scales the CMB has a basically a perfect black body. Um, so we know how to, like, there's no frequency information to use there. Okay. Um, to give you a better sense of how this uh, compares to the satellites, uh, I'll zoom in uh, to now 5 degree by 6 degree past sky, roughly 30 square degrees, where you can see the uh, effects of having a smaller beam and lower noise more accurately. This is what this past sky looks like with WMAP. Uh, you can see the very large scale temperature anisotropies in the CMB here. Uh, if you fast forward, uh, this is what happens when you go from WMAP to Planck. You now start to see smaller scale variations in the temperature distribution on the sky. And this is what happens when you fast forward to SVT pole. Um, now you're actually seeing these, you know, for the first time you start seeing features besides the cosmic background in your maps, as well as seeing very small scale anisotropies. Those are quasars, whatever. Yeah, I'll talk about the next slide. So the bright spots are, as you say, the very bright ones tend to be radio sources, <laughs> synchronous emissions from like ADN or quasars. Um, they dominate our bright source count. Uh, the size of these dots is, is not the size of the quasar, but it's the size of our resolution <laughs> on the sky, I should say. Um, the, as you go to the dimmer side, some of these are actually become dusty galaxies, the high red shifts, dusty star forming galaxies. <laughs> And we are seeing the very high flux ends. So these tend to be strongly lens versions of them. You know, we're talking about 10 milligencies, 20 milligencies objects. And about more than 50 of these have now been followed up with ALMA to look in more detail at the lens and galaxy model. But I won't be talking about these in this talk. Um, you can also see some dark spots in this map, uh, quite distinct from the white spots. And these are galaxy clusters. Effectively, these are shadows where we get fewer photons <laughs> along that line of sight uh, from the surface of that scattered. Um, and these are interesting for studying dark energy. Um, they're pretty easy to find with this resolution because they have a very characteristic signature. You know, they're the very small compared to the temperature anisotropies, and they're negative rather than positive, like uh, the galaxies would be. Now, these are the most massive objects in the universe, and just they are very rare. Question, my question. Yes. How much of the improvement was from the better beam size versus how much from the noise? It would depend on which science books you're talking about. For something like galaxy clusters, the beam size is very important. For something like polarization of the CMB, the noise is more important. <coughs> um, so galaxy clusters are very large, the most massive collapsed objects in the universe. Uh, and the key part for us is that although they contain a lot of galaxies, most of the ordinary baryonic matter in galaxy clusters isn't in the galaxies but in the intracluster media. And this falls into that massive potential and gets heated up to 10 to even 100 million Kelvin uh, and forms a diffuse hot plasma. And with this diffuse hot plasma, of course, you get thermal <coughs> Bremsstrahlung emission, which shows up in X-ray. And this purple coloration on top of the Hubble image is the X-ray from Chandra, image of that galaxy cluster. But this also means that if you have a CMB photon packing through this galaxy cluster and you have a scattering event, the CMB photon is only a few Kelvin the electrons you know, tens of millions of Kelvin, so the photon gains energy on average, and it's kicked up to higher frequencies out of our observing range. So we see fewer photons along the line of sight to a galaxy cluster. 
It's a nice way to detect these galaxy clusters because the brightness is independent of redshift. So you can detect them out of the redshift of formation. And counting these galaxy clusters is interesting because their number count uh, is quite sensitive to the properties of dark energy or neutrino masses and other parameters. We find that a lot of these objects, this is just a sampling of the first 782 degrees of our survey, uh, snapshots on detected galaxy clusters above 5 sigma. We expect on the order of 600 uh, objects within the full survey. And that catalog is being produced right now. Um, and we have around 200 confirmed galaxy clusters published so far. Um, and we'll do even better when you look at the uh, SBT 3G and SBT pole. What's nice about this is that we actually get comparable constraints from galaxy cluster number counts as you do from, say, supernova in terms of constraining the properties of dark energy. <coughs> and there are quite different probes of what we're looking at. Because now we're looking at structural growth instead of geometry. And by comparing structural growth and geometry, you can help distinguish between dark energy versus modified gravity and those two di different paradigms for what's causing acceleration. Um, but for the rest of this talk, we'll be talking about everything else in this map, which is the cosmic macro background, photons <coughs> coming from the surface of last scatter. And the typical way to discuss these is by looking at its power spectrum, because uh, this is a nice way to compress the information in that map into a much more easily manageable data set. And since these are basically galaxy perturbations, uh, we don't lose any information in this process. And additionally, we can predict the power spectrum quite well for any given model. So there's a very tight link between what we're observing and what the theoretical predictions are, which gives you very strong constraints <coughs> the knowledge. And this has motivated uh, strong experimental progress. So the cosmic micro background discovered back in 1965 by Pendis and Wilson. It took 27 years to actually discover any anisotropies in it. But, and that happened in 1992 with Kobe. But 10 years later, we've now gone from you know, measurements at you know, L30 or so all the way up to L3000. So a factor of 100 in angular scales probed in the 10 years after the first detection. And now, of course, you had the first week's peak, as well as the damping of the CMB. Five years later, you know, WMAP has come on the scene. This is the second data release of WMAP. Boomerang, uh, balloon experiment, and Akbar Matisse experiment out through the damping tail. And about a year ago, this is where we were with the last release of WMAP and the full survey, SBT survey. At this point, we've now gone forward to you know, nine acoustic peaks in the power spectrum with the data. And just to put through this again, to highlight that progress over the last few years, you know? Do you count that as nine peaks now or eight peaks? That's a, depending on how you want to count it. <laughs> <laughs> Just there, are you? We have not. Uh, <laughs> Where their particles are just going to be Yeah. So, you know, this, you know, we've gone from here to here to here. So, there's been tremendous progress mm -hmm. in the last decade in this field. Are you going to show the polarization peak? Uh, I would not actually show the polarization peak. Because then you would have to more. But there's four peaks that have <clears throat> polarization. OK, sorry. <laughs> But to um, better show the small scale feature, I'm now going to show you a plot of the y axis <laughs> multiplied by the x axis squared to tilt that up. Um, that is what we're showing here. And now you can actually, this is the second acoustic peak, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and then finally the ninth acoustic peak in the power spectrum. Uh, this plot also shows you the comparison of what the sample telescope band powers did compared to other data that was out there. So we also had ACBAR and ACT, which was the telescope in Chile, as the main uh, competitors on these small scales before Plum. And compared to either one of these experiments, the Southwell Telescope band fires improved this measurement by a factor of three across this entire angular range. Uh, now, in spring of 2013, last year, uh, Plum came out. And compared to Plum, based on the Southwell Telescope, uh, transitions around L of 1800, uh, to where the Plum data set is better at larger scales, and the SBT data set is better on smaller scales. This is just a comparison of all these data sets right now for our best measurement. Um, now, if you want to look at what we're looking at here and why we have <coughs> single frequency vampires down here and several frequencies out here, it's useful to understand what we're looking at. Um, so on this range of the power spectrum, we're looking basically at classic cosmic micro background. We have a basically a perfect black body dominated by the photons from that surface of black scatter. And as you go to the smaller English scales, you now begin to be dominated by interactions between those cosmic micro background photons and large scale structure, as well as foreground sources like the radio galaxies or dusty galaxies. And for those purposes, it's useful to have multi frequency information to disentangle the different possible signals. And that can be interesting for doing, say, measurements of the kinetic genome to Doge effect, 
and learning about the ionization history <laughs> of the universe. But for most of this talk, I'll be talking about this classic CMB. Um, we're in the process of improving these measurements, I should say, with a paper led by Elizabeth George, who's a graduate student at Berkeley that I'm supervising. Uh, and she just graduated, so this paper should be out pretty soon. Uh, and you know, starting out, you know, the transition point from where Planck uh, does a better job and goes all the way out to L11,000. Although I'm only showing out to 10,000 to match the previous plot. And these are a factor to improvement over what we have right now in the data set. I'll now transition to talking about cosmological interpretation of these band pairs and focusing on the causes of inflation. So the peaks that you're seeing in this power spectrum are caused by acoustic oscillations in that early hot plasma. Effectively, the idea is that as the universe expands from the beginning, a larger and larger modes enter the horizon and begin to evolve. So let's say our mode sees the dark matter overdensity and begins to fall in it. Uh, you see your first good peak when it's had just enough time to hit maximum compression, and then pressure kicks it back out. You get second good peak when it's at maximum rarefaction um, and a cold spot on the sky. So the peaks are alternating between compressions and rarefactions into those dark matter <laughs> overdensities. And what you measure best in terms of distance scales in the power spectrum, therefore, is actually the sound horizon scale um, at the surface of the last guy. Effectively, if we measure 90 peaks, we gain nine measurements of what that sound horizon is. And it's the angular size, since we mentioned angles on the side, so you also have a measurement of the angular diameter distance to the surface of the last guy. Uh, this is also the same sound scale that you used in, say, barren acoustic oscillations in the low redshift universe, just at a much different redshift scale. A second distance scale in your problem is the damping scale, which is why power is dropping off as you go to smaller scales. This is basically a measurement of what the mean free path is of the photons in that early hot plasma. And since they are going to diffuse out of small scale anisotropies, the perturbation will be damped as you go to smaller scales. In addition to those two distant scales in the problem, you have information about the acoustic peaks. Uh, so for instance, by looking at the even versus odd acoustic peaks, you're looking at compressions into in phase or out of phase into dark matter, and you can learn about the ratio of baryons to dark matter. A key point in looking at this is that all the current CMB power spectrum, including the sample telescope, are in good agreement with a six-parameter lambda CM model. Uh, the PTE for our data set is about 21% uh, for the, six, the best fit model of six parameters. Uh, so there's no real uh, tension with the model. Um, and actually, it turns out that with these data sets, it was now the first time which actually were getting comparable constraints from the damping scale physics that you were getting from the first two peaks on the six lambda CM parameters uh, compared to WMAP. So by combining SBT data with WMAP, you've got about a spurt of two improvement on the constraints in those six parameters. But where you really shine for doing a small scale ground experiment is when you start looking at extensions to the standard model, uh, which can then affect the ratio of that damping distance to the sound horizon scale. And we'll now transition to talking about that and looking at the initial conditions of inflation and what caused inflation. So there are generally three types of perturbations that you might consider in your model. First of all, of course, there have to be density fluctuations uh, because we exist and we're the product of you know, density fluctuations that have grown with time to form planets and stars. Um, these are the only perturbations that are growing with gravity in this expanding universe, so they're very important. In addition to those density perturbations, you can have potentially vector perturbations, which would be effectively eddies in your matter distribution. However, the spectral perturbations are exponentially damped in an expanding universe, so they are generally negligible within inflationary models, and I'm going to ignore them for this talk. And finally, you can have tensor perturbations, which are gravity waves. And generally, since inflation has this very rapid stretching of space-time in the early universe, it predicts some background of these gravity waves that you can detect on cosmological distance scales. And the amplitude of the gravity wave background relates to how rapidly the universe is expanding, and thus the energy scale, which is physics, comes into play. Uh, conventionally, you express the amplitude of your gravity wave background by a parameter r, which is the ratio of the tensor scalars. However, at this point, we've actually constrained the scalar amplitude quite well, to, so to a very good approximation, r can be viewed just as the amplitude of the gravity waves times some fixed prefactor. Uh, do the vector perturbations produce significant temperature power? Uh, I think it produces basically, I think it produces a lot of B-mode power, if I remember right. So they could produce BMOs, but not temperature. I don't think they did that. I mean, yeah, you could, yeah. They produced some temperature, but I don't remember how much. 
Uh, but my recollection is they do the ones that produce more of the mode. Um, actually, no, yeah, they only produce B-modes. I think you're right that there's not, not significant contributions. Um, one of the predictions of inflation is that the power spectrum of your initial perturbations <coughs> at the end of inflation should be nearly scale invariant. This is related to the fact that inflation is a nearly time invariant process. It doesn't really matter at what time a mode enters the horizon. Um, however, since inflation ends, it's not perfectly time invariant, and therefore, you expect some small deviation away from scale invariance. Um, now, if we express you know, uh, our power spectrum as you know, this frequency up to a power law, oops, n spec minus 1, n spec equals 1 will be scale invariance. Um, and if you change from n to best, this will lead to this impact on your temperature and exactly Effectively, you're tilting your power spectrum. And adding small scale data is useful because, of course, you're measuring a longer lever arm to measure what n sub s is. And indeed, by adding the small scale CMB data, we get very significant detections now of a departure from scale invariance. Uh, with WMAP, we had around 2 sigma. By adding that Southwell telescope data, you can bring this up to about 4 sigma, 3.9 sigma. And Planck raised this up to about 5 sigma, and Planck plus SBT, actually, which is another small scale experiment in DL, brings it up to around 7 sigma. So the small scale CMB data, even with Planck, is improving the measurement by you know, a factor of 1.4. This is now a very significant detection of a departure from scale invariance, matching that prediction of the inflationary model. Um, now, looking at gravity waves, the other uh, parameter we talked about, uh, gravity waves decay in an expanding universe. So uh, you see the largest impact on scales that were larger than the horizon at the last scattering surface. So very large scales. And these values of R range from no gravity waves, equal power in gravity waves on these large scales that you have in the scalar mode. And you can say that even if it's equal power at large scales by you know, L of 100, which is you know, a couple of degrees, on the sky, it's virtually no impact. Um, now, since SPT band powers don't start to you know, L of 600, another factor of 6 smaller, you might ask why does the small scale data actually help you on gravity waves? And the answer comes in the fact that we're not only varying the gravity wave background, of course. We have at least six other parameters in your model or more, depending on how many free parameters you want to do things. And over this range, you know, this change in tilt can, for instance, be mimicked by another parameter like N sub S. So if you, for instance, look at the best fit model for different values of the gravity wave background, um, with the WMAP data alone, you get good fits for the WMAP you know, large scale range, but then a disagreement on smaller scales due to how these degeneracies with the other parameters that you're adjusting to match the large scale data. And I should note here that I once again multiplied my y-axis by the x-axis squared to highlight the small scale shifts. These shifts are small, but they're about the size of the error bar for the Southwell telescope data. So we can break those degeneracies. In fact, we do. Uh, by combining WMAP plus Southwell telescope data, we get the best limits that we have right now on the tensor to scalar ratio, mm -hmm. so on the gravity wave background. Um, and we get limits when combining the CMB plus beta oscillation data at 95% constants that are less than 0.11. And this actually is about the fundamental limit for how well you can do from tensor data. If you calculate in a model where you only vary R, you fix all your other parameters, uh, and you find that about 50% of cosmologies, your 95% limit on R would be R less than 0.1. Uh, so we're right up against the theoretical limits due to the uh, limited number of modes on these large scales that you can get from the temperature data right now. And in fact, if you look at Planck's constraints, they're basically the same for that reason. Um, in the future, you can do better with polarization, as I'll talk about in a few slides. But you can already actually start to put constraints on some common inflationary models with the current data. Uh, and these are 1 and 2 sigma colored contrasts for WMAP, WMAP plus SPT, and all of the above. So let's focus on the blue curve here. And for a given form for the infraton potential, you can generally predict what the, the predicted values of both N sub S and R for that infraton potential. So if you have an exponential form for your infraton potential, you'll fall somewhere along this line. And you can see these forms of infraton potential are now disfavored at more than 2 sigma with that current data set. Uh, similarly, you can look at chaotic field inflation models, which are infraton potential as um, power law, um, which you predict, some, depending on what, how many e-formants are during inflation, you predict values that say look like this. And again, these are, uh, for high values of the <coughs> exponent, ruled out at several sigma with the current data. As you go towards small field models of inflation, like the hilltop model of inflation, 
it actually is consistent with the data. And to start to look into the small field inflation models, we'll have to move forward to use CMB polarization. Um, before I get there, I'll just note that uh, Planck data, as I mentioned, is consistent in the allowed parameter uh, ranges, the density and R, and with also consistent error bars um, with their data sets. To improve upon these plots, uh, we're looking forward to polarization, as I mentioned. So we can improve the x-axis, the constraint on the slope, uh, and to best, by about a factor of four from a combination of Planck plus SPT3G. Uh, most of this improvement will come from Planck polarization data that is supposed to be coming out in the next year or two. Uh, that'll be about a factor of three of this, about the remaining 30% will be coming from even smaller scales that you can get from the ground-based polarization. Um, and then there's a large impact for the ground on the gravity background R, uh, where you don't have the same confusion noise as you do in temperature. And something like the Simon array is predicting uh, order of magnitude improvement in our constraint on the gravity background. So R, you know, currently we're talking about sigma R of 0 0.055, and going down to sigma R of 0.005. Of course, I just realized it was not a window. Okay. It could be, but you know. Um, these are not yet the fundamental limits for how well you could do in the CMB. Uh, the fundamental limits for you know, measuring R and CMB, uh, then if you ask, are somewhere in the order of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5. So, you know, there's another factor of 50 to 500 that you could do with future CMB polarization experiments uh, with better detectors and lower noise levels. Depending on how far you want to be lens and what angular scales in the sky you're willing to use. Um, and I'll now transition to from sort of the power spectrum to talk about some of the other future improvements that we can get with CMB polarization. And in particular, I'll be talking about gravitational lensing of the CMB and how we can use this to learn about high rates of structural growth and the masses of the neutrino species. So to understand uh, <coughs> Lensing, let's just look at what an unlensed CMB mass looks like. This is 15 degrees by 15 degrees on a side. And this is what happens after you lens that area of sky. So you've probably have seen a uh, small shift between the two. You pick up by eye. It's still a small, um, but our current experiments are quite sensitive, so we can detect these kinds of deflections. To better view it, we can look at the difference map between these images. And as you can see, the actual individual deflections are an order of arc minutes. I think two and a half arc minutes RMS. Uh, these are in the weak field deflection limit. So each one of these, you know, observed deflections is probably from say 50 individual deflection events along that line of sight. And although these are small, they're coherent on large scales. So they're coherent over many, even tens of degrees. So you want a combination of both small scale information and large scale surveys. <coughs> you can then use this deflection field to reconstruct uh, the integrated uh, matter potential along that line of sight and give you a map of all mass in the universe along those lines of sight. Now, people are, of course, also talking about doing weak lensing surveys in optical. Uh, the CMB has a couple of differences compared to optical weak lensing surveys. Um, one notable difference is that the raw signal noise is lower. However, our systematic control is much better. Um, so it's very clean systematic because we have a very well understood source spectrum. You know, people have studied the temperature and polarization and it's the Gaussian, they have a well understood shape distribution on the sky. And all of our photons are coming from Z-Blum header. So there's no biases to you know what redshift their source uh, galaxies are at. It gives you a very clean systematic form. In addition to that, the second advantage uh, beyond systematic is just the redshift range of gravitational lensing. Uh, these are, you know, our highest redshift photons, so it's the only game in town if you want to do weak lensing at a redshift of a couple, a uh, redshift of four. The CMB is the only way you can do it because there aren't enough otherwise background galaxies behind it. And the redshift kernel for where you know most of the lending power is coming from is somewhere between a redshift of 0.5 up to a redshift of 4 or so. And using this, you can then actually, as I mentioned, make a map of all the mass in the universe on your patch of sky. This is an analysis of SPSC data being led by Oliver, which I'm working on the simulations with uh, for understanding what our transfer functions. And it's a mapping of 6% of the mass in the universe uh, over the 6% of the sky. Now, this is a smaller area than the Planck satellite lensing maps, um, but we have higher signal noise per mode. This signal noise is greater than 1 on these large scales. It's a realistic uh, reproduction of what the map distribution is. Um, this is a sort of estimated total signal noise, 20 sigma XT versus the all-sky 30 sigma. It's worth noting that these are very complementary. 
Um, about 75% of the SBT signal noise is coming from smaller scales than Planck has published. So it's a very different range of angular scales where we're getting our information compared to Planck. They aren't duplicating the same information. If I take a random block there, it's pretty sure that that's signal and not noise, or is there a mixture of signal and noise there? Um, the signal to noise is signal on order of two or one and a half. So it's not. So there's, there's there is noise in there. There's some blobs in there that are just noise. There are some blobs in there that are not. And how uniform is your transfer? Is it Monte Carlo transfer function? Hmm? <coughs> how uniform is the Monte Carlo transfer function? Um, it varies a little bit between fields. This is a stitching together of different, you know, 20 fields. How big is the correction? Um, it depends on what L scale you're talking about. It's normally around the peak. It's you know several percent, but on the oh, so very percent. large scales, it can be larger. It's a few percent to how many? Um, you know, up to infinite. If, I mean, at some point, we our high fat filter just kills all signal. I mean, we, you know, we have a high, we have a band fat filter effectively in our map making. So, if you go far enough to large or small scales, or we don't have any information. Sorry, this is an integrated mass from rich is zero out to the rich is yes. mm -hmm. And your beam size is much smaller than the size of one of those blobs. Yes. So, the ones that are real and not noise, it means like it's like the size of what the super clusters or filaments or what. Um, well, this is how you know, yeah. Um, I mean, it's not individual clusters. Right? No, these are way larger than individual yeah. clusters. These, these, these have are to be like giant, giant 100 megaparsec type yeah. scales. Super duper clusters. Super yeah. duper. These are you know, 100 megaparsec can be awesome. But right. this is like a WMF beach ball, but it's seen you're looking at dark. <coughs> yeah, I know. It's right. a yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. It's all nearby stuff, too. It's not out yeah. of yeah. That, That's what I was wondering, because it doesn't look like. I guess, cosmic web that we see. Yeah, I, mean, I guess the question would be like, what scale? Because I'm just not used to thinking about these various scales. Like the Sloan Great Wall would be how big on this scale? How big is the Sloan Great Wall? It's, it's like, up to, like, to eight degrees, one way to eight to ten degrees. Those are, uh, that's so those close. Are yeah, degree yeah. longitudes. Yeah, these are. Yeah, so if there's eight degrees, you can do like that. Okay. Um. So this is with temperature data. We have to average over many blobs to reconstruct the lensing. You can do much better if you go to polarization, get much higher field of noise. Now, polarization is basically a vector field on the sky. And one way to decompose the vector field is into modes that have gradients but no curl, analogous electric fields, and modes that have curl but no gradients, analogous to magnetic fields. We call this E and B. And the reason we tend to use this decomposition in cosmology is that those density fluctuations that we talked about, scalar perturbations, are not producing any B modes uh, due to for symmetry reasons. And that means there's no uh, confusion noise if you look at the B modes for understanding either gravity waves or gravitational lensing. And gravity waves produce B modes on very large, you know, several degree scales, uh, which can tell you about the gravity wave background from inflation. And as you go to arc minute scales, you're learning about gravitational lensing of this DMB. And you can distinguish between these two effects based on what angular scales you're looking at. To illustrate, now with both polar bear or SBT, we have relatively small beams. So they're very good at doing gravitational lensing. Uh, and to illustrate the impact of lensing on these different power spectrum, uh, we have both lens and lens power spectrum for the tensor isotopies. The changes are quite small. The E mode polarization isotopies, again, the changes are quite small. And when you go to the B mode power spectrum, now you get you know, two orders of magnitude shift in your observed B modes based on gravitational lensing. Uh, so if you can measure these B modes, you can get a very high signal to noise measurement of this lensing map on the sky. Of course, this plot also illustrates the challenge, which is, of course, that these three modes are quite faint compared to the anisotopies that we've been talking about so far. So you need very good instruments to get down to these low noise levels. <coughs> now, one thing you can do by looking at the distribution of mass on the sky at high redshift is to probe the masses from neutrinos. Uh, adding mass, changing mass from dark matter into neutrino mass uh, tends to increase the exchange <coughs> rate in the local universe, which delays structural growth. Sorry, and Christian, what's called the lensing B modes to peak of <coughs> reionization? Hmm? Peak. The lensing B mode, the light, yeah, why is that traced by reionization if it's B modes aren't? Oh, this is full. That's total. This is total. Okay. So but the difference is lensing. Right. So it's a, okay. Yeah, um, this is the total. But except for that small we it's all right. Perfect. Um, okay, yes. So, so, so I have another dumb question on the previous slide. Um, so this does this mean that you have to, in order to actually get the inflation B modes, you have to have made a map 
of the matter in the first place? Because otherwise you can't subtract out the lensing beam mode? It depends on how bright the ground waves are. I think below an R of on the order of 0.01, so 10 times lower than the current limits, you would start to have to worry about subtracting out the uh, lensing beam modes. But if it's you know within above that, you won't have to. You can just do it by only looking at the very large scales. And it'll be dominant on those large scales. Uh, so in other words, on the left of this plot, I don't have to subtract anywhere above 500 or so. I would have to subtract. Well, actually, it's pretty much L below L of 100 is where you're going to be seeing the gravity wave background. Yeah. So if it's this plot, it's hard to see. Oh, this is a log scale on the y axis. So. Yeah, the log scale on the y axis. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so if you change dark matter into neutrinos, uh, adding neutrino mass, uh, you expand, increase the expansion rate today, which slows down structure growth, um, since it's harder for that structure to exceed the expansion rate and start to collapse. And this leads to a suppression of structure growth on small scales by an amount that's just proportional to the total neutrino mass. And this leads to uh, these are some of the best constraints we have right now on neutrino masses. As you go to larger scales, then these massive neutrinos do start to cluster as well, which enhances structural growth, and basically cancels out that factor of expansion rate, so you have no changes on very large scale. And where the pink is will depend on the individual masses of the neutrino species. The key part for what we were just talking about is basically 100 milli electron volts of neutrino mass will change the BB power spectrum by 5%, to give you an idea of the size of the effect. Um, I'm involved with two experiments that are on the sky right now that are going for these science holes. This, of course, is SPT pole, the polarized camera on the South Pole Telescope, and polar bear, which, of course, Brian and other people in this room are working on as well. Um, but it's something of a coincidence that both of these experiments actually had first light uh, in the same month, um, January 2012. And they're pretty similar, actually, in terms of their mapping speed and sensitivity of the both They each have around 1,500 detectors with similar mapping speeds on the sky. However, they're quite different in terms of their ability, their technologies, and systematic control techniques. Um, so here we have these feed horns. Here we have dipole antennas with lens slits. <coughs> so very different detector technologies. They have different systematic control ranges, ranging from smaller beams to, say, rotating wave plates in polar bears cases. So they're quite different in their ability to control systematic, which is important as we go after very faint signals. This is a map from 54 days of polar bear data uh, showing you know, high signal noise maps of the CMB and its space. The science goals are similar for the experiment. Uh, with polarization, we want to do gravitational lensing, train neutrino masses. <coughs> and by adding the lensing information from polar bear or SPT pole, you can improve the constraint from Planck by a, a factor of 1.7, going from a sigma of 170 millilectron volts down to 100 millilectron volts on the neutrino mass. In addition, we hope to get about a factor of two to three improvement on the gravity wave background with these experiments. Uh, going from you know, limits of R less than 0.11 to R less than 0.3, 0.05 uh, with uh, these two experiments uh, with the large scale of pollution data. And this, in some sense, uh, illustrates what your question was, which is, you know, for you know, R of 0.02, the gravity wave signal is dominant over the residual lens signal, but as you get a very low values of R, then you start to have to worry about what the lens signal is on those large scales. Uh, and you'll have to start subtracting that one. Um, in addition, with the small beam, SPT pole will do a lot of cluster science. Uh, we expect to have about 1,000 clusters within our area of sky for SPT pole. Um, and this will be lower mass clusters than we have in the current survey, because we have lower noise uh, with four times deeper mass. All these clusters will be in the dark energy survey footprint, so you can do studies between the dark energy survey and the SPT on these clusters, uh, on these objects. What's been new in the last six months or so is that we've actually started to detect the lensing beam modes for the first time. Um, and doing lens reconstruction in polarization is quite different than what you do in temperature, where you have to average over many modes. Um, in lensing, uh, since there's no initial signal in beam mode, if you measure an E-mode map and you measure a B-mode map, there's really a one-to-one -one correspondence that then tells you what the lensing potential is for one mode in that sky. You can pretty much do a fitting process in the scheme. Now, we'd like to do a cross-correlation for first detection to guard against systematics. So a natural question, then, is what you can use as a cross-correlation source for that lensing potential map. Um, if you look at what would be correlated uh, with a lensing kernel that peaks around a redshift of 2, and this is the lensing kernel in red, 
Um, it's a fairly high redshift distribution, higher than, for instance, the NVSS radius or scala with peaks around a of 1. Um, however, it's quite well matched to the expected distribution of dusty galaxies. And if you use, say, the single SED model from Paul to predict the distribution of these dusty galaxies for observed counts, you calculate something like an 80% correlation between the distribution of dusty galaxies from which can be measured with Herschel Spire, a satellite, uh, and the lensing uh, potential on the sky. So in doing this cross-correlation, uh, we can use the Herschel maps as our measurement of what that lensing satellite is. And since Herschel is a satellite and we're a ground experiment, they're very different experiments, and it's very unlikely to have any kind of instrumental effect that would contribute systematically to both experiments. Um, and that's what we've done, both with SBT pole as well as polar bear. Uh, we took the EMO map from SBT pole, a density map from Herschel's fire, and used that to predict what the BMO map should be. And then we correlate that predicted BMO map to our observed BMO map and detect a signal. And we detect a signal with SBT pole at 7.7 .7 sigma and with polar bear at 4.0 sigma. Polar bear has also done a separate analysis that's not a cross correlation uh, internally using CV polarization led by Chang here in the audience uh, to get the detection at 4.2 sigma as well using CMB polarization alone of the lensing viewer. Uh, so we're now actually seeing this polarized lensing signal for the first time. And you can put band powers on like CLDB and check whether they're consistent with your predictions of the standard cosmological model. Um, and we find that they are. The dashed line is sort of the prediction for what this BB signal should be. And the data points are these band parts here. And we find consistency between different estimators and also different frequency ranges. Uh, they're all internally consistent. And when we do tests that should have no signal, like using a difference map instead of a co added map for one of those uh, correlations, we find results that are consistent with zero. And we see no evidence for a residual systematic error to just a ground pickup in one of our telescopes. Um, it's worth noting, though, that these are only sensitive to B modes from lensing. Uh, so you wouldn't see B-modes from, say, vector perturbations or from more magnetic fields. And you also wouldn't see B-modes from gravity waves, um, both because of its correlation, but also because we're probing very different angular scales. The gravity wave signal, they should know this L less than 100 band, uh, where these band parts are starting at L500 and above. Uh, to improve this, uh, of course, there's the Simons ray, which is going to dramatically expand the sky area that we're talking about. Up to something like 50% of the sky will be covered with the Simons Ray, which is an array of three uh, three meter telescopes in Chile. Um, and that'll be an excellent data set for effectively covering that beach ball just with maps of the dark matter distribution on the sky. And you can do correlations between that with other of these large optical surveys like LSST that are going on in the southern hemisphere, as well as CCAT and other experiments. Uh, SPT-3G is doing a slightly different scan trace. So this is doing a large area, 50% of the sky. SPT-3G is doing a much more focused sky, so you can actually get a wedding cake and pattern <laughs> between the two experiments. So now we're doing, you know, 6% of the sky instead of 50% of the sky, uh, but down to lower noise levels. And actually, the detectors in both cases are the sinuous wave, broadband sinuous wave antennas, uh, shown here, uh, coupled with lenses to the telescope. Um, one of the main goals, as I mentioned, was neutrino mass. Uh, with the current air bar for SPT pole, our polar bear being about 100 millimeter volts. Uh, for the CMB alone, uh, you get strength on the order of 50 millimeter volts from the Simon Ray or SPT3G. And these are the 1 and 2 sigma constraints from the CMB plus CMB lensing. As you can see, there's a degeneracy uh, between the neutrino mass and the total matter density in the universe. Uh, effectively, if you increase the matter density and increase the neutrino mass, you end up with the same amount of structure and the same amount of gravitational lensing on the sky. Um, but it turns out that there's a very nice uh, other data point, which is spin Hoots oscillation data. Uh, and that actually has nearly perpendicular degeneracies. So if you add MS density to, say, the Simon's Ray or SP3G, you end up with a very tight constraint on your neutrino masses. And you actually can get down to neutrino mass constraints that are about 18 millilecton volts for the Simon Ray, or 22 millilecton volts for SPT3G. So on the order of 20 millilecton volts, which could then potentially uh, discriminate between normal and varied hierarchies, or actually make a detection of the neutrino mass um, at high significance. Certainly, if any of the current ideas about neutrino mass being an explanation for the discrepancy between galaxy cluster count 
with Planck, and which are you know 200 mill electron volt neutrino masses, we can detect that you know 10 sigma or more. Um, of course, is that affected by so you know for example Planck gets uh, you know um, somewhat lower it predicts a lower value of the Hubble parameter and um, a slightly different ratio of matter to dark energy for example. So if, if there's some ideas on this, that maybe you can resolve that by some extra radiation energy density or some um, uh, this, photons, but it, does that affect what these neutrino limits would be? Um, for the CMB alone, it does not have a large impact. I mean, we did, you know, uh, lens, for the SPT3D, we certainly did constraints with an effective running and all these other free parameters right. and did not make a big difference in it. I don't know what happens <coughs> um, this affects the with NSAZ. itself, right? So, um, it's a little more serious. This plot itself does not have a pretty. I'm not 100 percent sure of how whether the degeneracy curve changes when you have an effect and all these other parameters, W, etc. In that, um, it, yeah. Uh, and yeah, and you also get you know improvements on the number of uh, relative species in the universe. So for instance, SPT3G with their higher, smaller scales in the polar power spectrum. Uh, give you about a factor of two, factor of 1.8 improvement on the constraints that are effective you can get from Planck and when you start having multiple parameters free. And I'll conclude there. Uh, SBT band parts are still the best measurement of small scale anisotropies between you know, LS of 1800 up to LS of 10,000, uh, both on the primary and secondary CMB anisotropies. Uh, these are particularly interesting for looking at deviations from the standard cosmological model. Both you know gravity waves, but also if you look at papers, neutrino mass, number of neutrino species, uh, early dark energy, etc. And we've just had in the last six months the first detections of B modes in the CMB polarization. And in the next year, we should certainly have the first actual CLBBs, the power spectrum, uh, as well as polarized power spectrum from these experiments that are pretty constrained mm -hmm. both on inflation and structure growth, as well as particle physics. So for instance, you can get constraints on decaying dark matter uh, by looking at the temperature to polarize correlations in the CMB polarized power spectrum. Um, and I will conclude there and ask for any other questions. So is there any degeneracy between early dark energy and something like an effective or neutrino mass? Um, there are degeneracies. Uh, uh, now, th those ineffective constraints I used did have early dark energy in them at the same time, so they that constraint included, and the improvement included the those degeneracies. Um, that, was, that was something like, I think we had early dark energy, W, running, ineffective, and new, and uh, Y helium as well. That's better. So, you know, it was including a bunch of them at the same time for those sites. What kind of measurements could resolve those details, like plate-like measurements, low redshift measurements, for example, or would have to be? Um. <laughs> 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 uh, so certainly, like very data, uh, measurements of galaxy cluster bonuses. I mean, your standard set of other data sets. Uh, I think, but the geometry depth measurements are particularly powerful. <coughs> Could you go back to the image, uh, the very like the zoom in resolution image uh, as you go from like the very beginning? To, uh, yeah, from a point source person. So. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not going to see planets. I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> like, do, you, do you now identify all of the point sources as as galaxy clusters? Uh, or Wait, galaxies, the, sorry, the, the white ones? Yeah, the bright ones of galaxies, but you identified all of this as radio sources. No, some they of them are yeah, definitely not radio sources. Right? Some of them are dusty galaxies. Okay. And we've <laughs> seen you know, that they have dust-like <laughs> spectrum. We see them with ALMA. Uh, we have, we've seen you know, the individual star. Some of them you know, have Herschel data on them as well. So, I mean, certainly, most, all the bright, very bright ones are radio galaxies, are consistent with radio galaxies. They have counterparts, well, not all, most of them have counterparts in radio surveys, uh, but they all have, you know, falling spectra where they're brighter at low frequencies, the dimmer at high frequencies, um, and are consistent with, you know, radio-like emission. Um, I think on the order of 90% of them have correlations with C radio catalogs.
the remaining 10% do not. Do you have any variability information from the survey? We have some variability information. We have not looked at it. Um, I mean, so typically we'll have a few months of data to six months of data on the patch, so you have that much variability information. Um, and certainly the bright ones, our brightest sources, right, we can detect in a given a single hour observation. Um, so depending on the brightness of the source also for how much information we have. Other questions? I have a really stupid one. Uh, I mean, we don't accept the question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as somebody who's not on the screen, I, know, I mean, it seems to me like it's a kind of a big deal observing the mortar. I don't think. Yeah, and you're not. <laughs> but, so, so, but, but, but you state that you've observed them. How, I mean, how, you're not showing how you observe them. How, how is it not the background? How is it not instrumental effect? I mean, why do these people believe it? I mean, at least if I was becoming a famous player like this, you know. You did show, actually. I did show some of the notes. How do you show that this is weird? What to a guy next to you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay. he's got so a question. I don't know. You can show it. It's a good question. How do you know it's not some instrumental effect? There were things around here. Where? Show me the list. So. I thought it was more of a statement of a result. No, they checked for that. Yeah. I saw this convolution. Right. Right. So like the arguments against systematic would be first that they have the correlation, so your error would have to be correlated between your satellite and your ground base. And second, whoa, 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 so you, oh, but I'm saying that that's the African correlation. Because there's an instrumental correlation. If this was all due to an instrumental Yeah, but you can't weirdness. take credit for something that you already have used in order to establish significance, no? Um, so so if, you, if you want me to, if you want to convince me that you've seen it, then you have to give me something that was not used in determining the significance of the observation. Sure. Um, so I would say there's a logical argument, which is that if you had, say, ground pickup that was contributing polarization in the CMB, in our experiment, it would not correlate to that satellite, and therefore you wouldn't have seen it. Um, the other argument would be that, so we use 150 gigahertz data. Um, we've repeated the analysis with 90 gigahertz data. Uh, one of these plots, the green versus the black. And you can see you know, the values are consistent, only use different detectors. Um, we use a different estimator for the B modes, so changing the B mode map that we are correlating on. And that is the difference between, say, the black and the orange. And again, you get a uh, consistent answer. Uh, we've done compared to temperature derived mm -hmm. lensing maps and get a consistent answer. We do null tests to look for systematic errors. So, for instance, uh, doing a difference between either your e mode map being a difference map or other time varying sources like first half or second half or sun up, sun down type things. And we don't see any signals in the correlation signal. Uh, yeah, and one of these null tests is shown in gray, but there are other ones that aren't shown. Um, we've done other null tests of B-mode as well as E-mode. And if you do a curl type test where you don't expect to see a lens signal, you don't see any signal as well, um, whereas you might see some instrumental effects. Um, and it's also true that this is a, uh, you know, the lens expected lensing signal. So you, we have seen lensing with temperature at high field noise, and this is confirming that we see the same thing in polarization. Um, so, you know, our signal noise on lensing with CMB is now 30 sigma. So these are still a lower signal noise measurement of the total lensing power spectrum than normal gain from temperature um, right now because of the data quality. Okay. Uh, maybe one more question. Uh, I have a stupid question. Uh, if you, with the soft pulse telescope, you've got a lot uh, better resolution than you do with polar bear. What do you think about measuring the polarized SDF? Is that a possibility with SPP 3 g Um. What would that tell us? I think we looked at this for SPT 3D and it did not seem particularly possible or particularly interesting. Uh, the signal noise is not very good. Um, I don't think it actually will be useful for SPT 3D. Um, <coughs> some things people have talked about doing with like the <coughs> clusters are uh, measuring the cluster masses with CMB lensing, so using polarized lensing to measure the cluster masses. And we expect to get you know, a couple percent mass calibration uh, in stacked analysis over the clusters. And that can help the cluster cosmology. And there are other ideas, like looking for the kinetic genome of the doge effect in the individual clusters to learn, recover the velocity fields 
And then you have the velocity field, you know, uh, 100 megaparsec scale uh, that can tell you about, say, model type gravity type model, foot constraints on, you know, GR on those scales. Okay, great. Well, there are no more questions. Thank you for seeing that. We did not play with the next one. Frank, you want to get out of the way? Oh, uh, we're going to be next. Oh, no. The bunch of us are going to go to the Prime Center for lunch. Do you want to bring Evan for a sensor field? Or do you want to be your side by? All right, yeah. It's a point that I have. Are you going to try to call them after email, or are you going to leave those at lunch at this point? Um, I haven't got a point of emailing them yet. So. Yeah, me neither, but I just want to know what you usually put in the email. Um, like is it, the, is it, is it all that some of us, either you and me or someone that are so, um, in the or something like that? So what I'm going to send, uh, like I'm going to send Allison, most people who named her, you know, came, you know, send individual people who named them. And then I will send them email and then you can reach the person that they Okay, so you'll first send the general blurb email about so, things you're going to build, and then the individual people can get in touch with them. Yeah.